The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense, to the fear you can hear, to the world of terrifying imagination. They say, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And perhaps it's true. But the question is, how long can that fury endure? How long can the passions burn? Well, Miss Charity Youngblood was left waiting at the church some 200 years ago. And she still isn't over it. Sheriff's office, Deputy Palmer speaking. Sheriff, I, uh, there's someone who wants to murder me. Yes, sir. Your name, sir? Well, is, is that important? Yes, sir, it is. Well, I, I hesitate to give you my name because, because you might think I'm, I'm unbalanced. Now, why would I think that? Because of the peculiar circumstances involved. Why don't you let me be the judge of that? Well, this young lady wants to kill me, and, and she's armed. What's her name? Well, I, I, I wouldn't want her to get into trouble. What? She, she doesn't look like a killer, and besides, I can't prove it. It's just that I know it. Now, sir, calm yourself and tell me why does she want to kill you? Because I broke our engagement. No, right. it's possible. Now, when did you break that engagement? Oh, about 200 years ago. Our mystery drama, A Dream of Death was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Michael Tolan. It is sponsored in part by new sugar-free diet 7-Up and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Hello, Ms. Goldilocks here, and welcome to my professional taste-testing laboratory. Oh, Papa Bear, mm -hmm. could you bring that case of sugar-free Diet 7-Up over here? Another case? Miss Goldilocks, you're drinking this sugar-free Diet 7-Up like there's no tomorrow. You can't still be taste-testing it. Oh, no, Papa Bear. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up has already earned my seal of approval. It's fresh, light, natural. Delicious. I drink it because I love its taste. Now hurry up. Okay, okay, here. Mm-hmm. This sugar-free diet 7-Up really tastes delicious. Ladies, if you're tired of switching from one diet drink to another, take some advice from Ms. Goldilocks. Try sugar-free diet 7-Up and you'll say, Yes, this one's just right. I'll bear witness to that, Goldie. <laughs> Young I may be, but still I'm a man Just turned 18 and I'll do what I can To find me a place where I can be me Get ready for life and be free and see Where do I go from here? Oh, where do I go from here? I finished the school, but what lies ahead? Don't want to get trapped, want to feel free and the new Navy. You'll get your chance at success, learn an exciting job, and see the world. Call toll-free 800-841-8000. That's 800-841-8000. Or see your Navy recruiter. Be someone special in the new Navy. I know where I'm going from here. Sometimes, 
A few notes of an incomplete melody may steal through your head. It isn't like any tune you know, and yet you've heard it before. For no reason, a name, a noise, an aroma may evoke a dim and distant memory. A memory of a place you cannot clearly remember, but it's a place you cannot completely forget. A great poet said, life is a dream, and even dreams are dreams. Perhaps, but sooner or later, there must be an awakening for every dream. And for Rexford Patterson, there was the rudest awakening of all. Hey, Patterson, wake up. Your lawyer's here. Huh? W what? Your lawyer's here. Lawyer? Why? What? What do I want a lawyer for? Where am I? You're in a jailhouse. Jailhouse? How did I get... I demand to see a lawyer. Mister, no sooner said than done. He's all yours, Counselor. All right, Sheriff, if uh, you would leave us. Bang on the door when you want out, Counselor. Who are you? Why am I in here? My name is uh, Peter Evans. I'm an attorney. I was retained by the university on your behalf. Why do I need a lawyer? Why? Well, you're going to be tried for murder. Who is? You are. But that's impossible. You don't remember? Murder? Murder? No. Well, according to the sheriff, you were found unconscious on the floor of your study and she'd been shot. Who? Your fiancé. Charity? I... I killed Charity? No, 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 no. Madeline Betty, your fiancé. Madeline Betty Powers. Who's Charity? Charity. Charity Youngblood. She was my fiancée. You had two of them? Look, we know you were engaged to Madeline Betty Powers. Now you say you were also engaged to a Miss Charity Youngblood? Yes. Well, what happened to that engagement? I broke it. Was the parting amicable? No. How did Miss Youngblood take it? She was... She was hurt. Angry. She was violent. What do you mean, uh, violent? She swore she would make me regret it. She swore she would have a revenge. Can you prove any of this? Oh, yes. How? Oh. I have it in writing. Well, now, this may throw a new light on the case. When did you break your engagement to Miss Youngblood? When? Uh, about... 200 years oh, ago. Good. See, if we can produce written evidence... When did you say you broke this engagement? I... I was killed at the Battle of Monmouth in 78. And three years before that would be, uh... the early spring of 1775. Allow me to suggest the only plea that will save you. Insanity. No, I will insist that we plead the truth. Well, what is the truth? Self-defense... I killed Charity Youngblood in self-defense. All right. Look. Now, you may have killed Miss Youngblood in self-defense 200 years ago, but that's... It's over. It's gone. It's done with. Nobody wants you for that. You're going to be tried for the murder of Madeline Betty Powers. Exactly. Charity Youngblood is Madeline Betty Powers. Professor Patterson... You're my attorney. I have to tell you the truth. But I can't believe it. But I can prove it. Look, go... Go to my apartment. In the middle drawer of my desk, there's a book. An old book. An old leather notebook. Bring it here. You'll see. You'll see for yourself. Proof. You read the book? Yes. It's a diary kept by a girl named Charity Youngblood, daughter of a Connecticut gunsmith during the Revolutionary War. She was jilted by a young officer named Eli Wallington. Naturally, she was uh, quite upset about it. But where is the proof you promised me? I was that young officer. I was Eli Wallington. Oh, look, Professor Patterson, if I'm to represent you, you'll simply have to the tell truth, me... The truth, the truth, I know the truth. 
Well, I tell you the truth and you refuse to believe me. It's impossible to believe you. Impossible. That's the key word. Well, today's commonplace was yesterday's impossibility. People said it was impossible to transplant a heart, impossible to walk on the moon. You're talking about reincarnation. Last summer, I stopped at an antique shop in central Connecticut. Heaped high on a counter was a pile of old pictures, letters, books. I picked up that little notebook, the one you're now holding. I read that name, that hand-lettered name, Charity Youngblood. And suddenly I felt as if, as if I'd been stabbed through the heart. I, I knew that name. I knew that name. Please, Professor Patterson. No, don't tell me to be calm. Don't humor me. Just listen to me. I knew that name. I knew the girl. I knew the time. I knew the place. Here, t turn to the page where she describes how he proposed to her. I just don't see how just all of... do it. All right. Uh, uh, this is what you want? Monday. Eli proposed marriage to me this morning. I read the name Eli. An electric shock ran through my system. I knew I was Eli. And the entire scene ran through my mind. Exactly as she wrote it in her diary. Exactly. <laughs> Good morning, Charity. Oh, it's the high and mighty Lieutenant Eli Wallington. Come to see my father? Hmm? Well, that pistol of yours isn't ready. I've come to see you, Charity. I've been foolish. It doesn't interest me. Charity, I love you. Oh, yes, you love me. Believe me. Oh, I believe you. You love me here. You love me now. But tomorrow you'll be somewhere else. You'll see someone else. You'll love someone else. Men are fools. We don't realize at first how important it is to have a woman who really loves us. And you love me. Please go. Marry me, Charity. Eli. We'll have the bands on Sunday and marry the week after. Now, come, close the shop. We'll go riding this morning. But I promised Father... Let's that... be together this morning. Come with me. Oh, Eli, you're a scoundrel. Yes, Charity. But I'm your scoundrel. You must never forget that, Eli. Never forget that. What are you trying to tell me, Professor Patterson? Don't you see, as Eli Wallington, I had lived through that scene. I, I knew how I felt. I loved her. How do you know you were Eli Wallington? How do we know you're Peter Evans? You know, you just know, that's all. None of this is proof in a court of law. You can read in her diary. Yes, Sunday. This morning, the bands were read in the church. <laughs> but Eli never married her. Do you know why? Because Charity was right. The very next week, Eli was somewhere else. He saw someone else. He loved someone else. He never saw Charity again. And three years later, he was dead at Monmouth. Turn to Charity's diary. See what she wrote when she heard the news of Eli's death. Here's the evidence you need to defend me in court. Read it. All right. Now, Friday. This morning, the Reverend Fallowfield came into the shop with me. Charity, I am told that... Eli Wallington has fallen at Monmouth. I thought you might wish to know. Thank you, Reverend. He died bravely for his country. And I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive him. I will not forgive him. Charity. On that Sunday, that awful Sunday, I swore I'd kill him. But the boy is already dead. He'll live again. I'll live again. I'll find him and kill him. Give up this frightful hatred before it destroys you. He won't escape. If only I could help you, Charity. No one can help me. And no one can help Eli. Somewhere, somehow, someday, I'll have my revenge. <laughs> Charity. 
mind when I picked up that diary in the antique shop, Mr. Evans. I was almost frozen with terror. I knew I had come back. Why shouldn't she? Huh. But you know something? After a while, I began to laugh at myself. Why? Well, for the same reason you're probably laughing at me. After all, we live in the modern, rational 20th century. Every night, I'd, I'd sit alone at home and wait. Wait for Charity to come and kill me. And nothing happened. She didn't show up. No. And you can't maintain an emotional pitch forever. And so soon, I, I stopped thinking about it. And then one afternoon, I was sitting in my study. Come in, it's not locked. Good afternoon, Professor Patterson. Uh, yes. Uh, let me see, you're Miss... Uh... Powers. Madeline Betty Powers. I'm scheduled for a conference at exactly 1,500 hours. 1,500 hours? 3 p.m. We use this terminology at the engineering school. Oh, I, uh, I see. You're an engineering major, Miss Powers? Have you any objections? Oh, no, certainly not. Professor, I require three credits in the humanities for my degree. I chose your American history course. I am flattered. It was the only one open. <laughs> you shouldn't have said that. Oh, I have no interest in the dead past, only in the dynamic present. How can I survive your course? First, uh, show up for class, occasionally. Second, don't snore too loudly at my lectures. <laughs> Third, write me a term paper. On what subject? Oh, any subject related to the Revolutionary War. I know what I'll do. I'll write a novel. Miss Powers, what are you saying? Yes, a novel. A novel about a girl... But, Miss Powers, you ask for an easy way out. A novel is the most difficult project. You know what gave me the idea for it, Professor? This antique pistol on your desk. What? That <laughs> broken down, rusty old relic? It just came to me. By just looking at it, I'll write about a girl whose father was a gunsmith. But what did you say? In in one of the thirteen colonies, um, Connecticut. But Miss Powers, do you do you know anything about Connecticut during the Revolution? No, no, I'm, I'll make it up. After all, it's a novel. Have you ever been to Connecticut? No, never in my life. Now, the girl, the heroine of my novel, will be. Beautiful, sexy. I can see her. I can just see what she looks like. And her name, I even know her name. What is it? I think I have a good one. Her name No, is... no, don't don't tell me. Write it down on a piece of paper. But don't let me see what you're writing. But why? Please do as I ask, Miss Powers. All right. You've written her name? Yes, Professor. Her name is Charity. Charity Youngblood. Professor Patterson. How did you know? How does he know? Funny how these things work out, no? You can never tell who you'll come back as. Devil May Care Adventurer. He's getting any money, but he's entitled. Well, what's wrong with writing a letter saying that, under the law, this man is entitled to receive $220 a month for attending school on a full-time basis? Believe it or not, he can take that letter with the little job, take it to the real estate people, and because he has an additional income of $220, although he isn't receiving it, it makes his chances of getting that apartment much better. And, and this is what I mean about the little things. Going beyond the duty every once in a while. Just go a little bit out of your way to help someone. Uh, that's my philosophy. To me, these are little things. But big things to that person. Very A big thing to that person. At VA, we try a little harder to help. Professor Patterson. A quiet teacher of history is in jail, accused of killing his fiancée. He doesn't deny it. What he's desperately trying to prove is that he killed the one he had 200 years ago. Where, where, Miss Powers, have you heard that name 
charity young blood before. Nowhere. I made it up. You made it up? Well, charity sounds like a name a girl might have had oh, 200 years ago. And young blood has a kind of colonial quality to it. Charity, young blood. It just sort of popped into my head. And it all... Everything just came to you? The whole idea for the novel? The heroine? Her name? It all occur to you just now? Yes, that's right, Professor Patterson. I simply can't account for it. It has no scientific basis. But suddenly, uh, I have feelings that I've never experienced before. What sort of feelings? I can't describe them. Vague ideas, hazy pictures. Of what? But this woman, this girl, this charity, young blood, she... She's a creature of my own imagination. I only conjured her up a few moments ago, and yet she seems to be alive. Give it up, Miss Powers. You know, sometimes when you write fiction, the character takes over. And unless you're a skilled professional author, this can be dangerous. Just attend class, look intelligent, and you'll pass the course. Oh, well, Professor, that wouldn't be ethical. Miss Powers, we'll just let that be our secret. <laughs> Hello. Professor Patterson. This is Miss Powers. What? M Miss Powers? Madeline Betty Powers. Did I wake you up? I I'm sorry. I know it's midnight, but I must see you at once. Please. Well, I... It's uh, important. It... Where? Well, I'm calling from the all-night cafeteria at the student union building. I'll... I'll be there. Oh, thank you, Professor. <laughs> I had to see you. And I didn't think it would be proper for me to go to your apartment at this hour. Well, what what seems to be the problem, Miss Powers? The story. The story? The story of Charity Youngblood. Well, I thought we decided to drop it. But that's the problem. I, I can't seem to get it out of my mind. Well, I'm sure you... It's taken over. I can't think of anything else. I, I, well, I'm obsessed by it. This girl... Charity, young blood. I know her so well, I sometimes think... <laughs> no, you'll laugh. No, tell me. I s sometimes think she's me. <laughs> well, of course she's you. What are you saying? Well, when, when you write fiction, every character has to be yourself in one form or another. No, no, it's more than that. It's, it's a feeling in my bones. I, I seem to have... An urge to do something. What? I don't know. But I keep writing. Now, I've written 20 pages so far, and most of the time it doesn't even seem that I'm the one who's doing the writing. I get the feeling that I'm just holding the pen, and my hand is being guided. I'd like you to read what I've written so far. Please. Miss Powers, you, you've been working too hard. No, no, I just... I just feel that something is happening to me. I seem to feel I have some sort of mission. What kind of mission? Well, I don't know. But every day I feel it's becoming clearer. But I still have no idea of what it is. And every day, Mr. Evans, she would hand me a chapter of her novel. And that novel will win me acquittal in court. Why? Because each chapter is word for word a day in Charity Youngblood's original diary. In Madeline Betty's own handwriting. Where's that novel now? In my desk. I... I did everything I could to get her to stop writing. Hoping that, that somehow I could get her mind off it. But of course that was useless. After all, if she really was Charity Youngblood, and there was no doubt in my mind about it, nothing would stop her from finding it out. And every day she was getting closer. Not just to Charity, but to me. Professor.
Tessa, I decided to give Charity a love interest. We're about to have the war, and I've created a young cavalry officer of the Connecticut Brigade. I have a name for him. Eli Wallington. Eli Wallington? Yes. Miss that... Powers, you, you've already written more than enough to earn a good grade. It's already longer than the average term paper. Oh, but I have to finish. Why? This whole thing started as a term project. Yes, it and may as far... have started that way, but now it's, it's something that belongs to me, and I can't help it. I have to keep writing until... Until? Until something happens. What? What is supposed to happen? I don't know. But I'm afraid. I'm very much afraid. <laughs> I was afraid too, Mr. Evans. Afraid that at any time she would suddenly realize that she wanted to kill me. But surely, surely you realize. What? You mean I had nothing to be afraid of? Suppose someone's determined to kill you and you know it. You tell me. You know what I think? Although it's academic now. I think you should have gone to a psychiatrist. I did. I went to the top. I went to the head of the Department of Psychiatry at the University Hospital. Now, let us see if we can delve into the core of these hallucinations. No, let's not, Dr. Laffer. You see, these are not hallucinations. No. No. These are matters of fact. I know them to be true. You're talking about reincarnation. Yes. And you obviously don't believe in it. That's hardly the point. It may exist, for all I know. However, if it does... And we have no way of knowing who we were in a past lifetime. Perhaps we had no way of knowing. Perhaps today, with heightened powers of communication, perhaps our modern scientific technology has upset certain natural balances. Whatever. The fact is, I know. If you know, you know. What do you want me to do? Suggest a way I can live with it. I'm afraid I don't understand. Look, if, if a man was an alcoholic or a drug addict or, or a gambler, and he said to you, this is what's wrong with me, how do I live with it? What would you tell him? You are oversimplifying. I am a... I'll coin the word. Reincarnate. How do I live with it? Especially since my life is in danger. Very well. Why is your life in danger? I told you. Charity Youngblood wants her revenge. And she's here in the person of Madeline Betty Powers to exact it. Don't you see what you must do? No. This is all within the framework you yourself have created. If you remove the motive, you can prevent the crime. I still don't know what if you mean. If she wants to kill you because you jilted her, well, all you have to do is give her satisfaction. How? Marry her. Marry her? Marry Madeline Betty? She's hardly my type. You're 32 years old. You're not married. Are you going with anyone? No. But marry her? How do I know she'll have me? Were you once Eli Wallington? Yes. Was she once Charity Youngblood? Yes. She'll have you. Oh, Professor Patterson, you really didn't have to take me to dinner. Well, our, our conference ran late. We have to eat. Well, I mean, to a place like this. Well, this is a very nice place. Or so I thought. Oh. Would you, uh... Would you care to dance? Oh, no, thank you. I... I dance rather poorly. Oh, I can't believe that. Why can't you believe it? Because you're so charming. I don't think so. At least no one ever told me that. But I think so. Do you? Why? Well, it's... It's a subjective thing. I lied to you just now. I said I dance poorly. The truth is, I... <laughs> I don't dance at all. Now, how is that possible? Girls who don't get asked usually don't bother to learn. <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling you all this. It's just that since the day I met you, I, I started thinking. I don't know how to describe it. Well, what were you thinking? Oh, crazy things. 
And that is for me. I suddenly wanted to write a book. Why, I'll never know. And I began thinking of a girl who lived hundreds of years ago in a place I've never heard of. I, I, I can't understand it. Madeline Betty, maybe I can help you. Would you, Professor Patterson? Rex. Go on, say it. Call me Rex. Rex. I've also felt something since the time you walked into my study for conference. And, and I've been trying to analyze it. And I finally discovered what it is. It's love. Professor Patterson. Rex. And so I... I'm asking you, I hope... that you will marry me. If you're going along with what Rex believes, they're playing the scene again. Rex and Madeline Betty have now reached the point where Eli proposed to Charity. Charity said yes, but will Madeline Betty? Yes or no will be the first word you will hear when we return shortly with Act Three. And now, another story of the ball and chain, as Kellogg's Special K presents The Library. Welcome to the public library. May I help you, sir? Uh, yes, I'd like to check out... Uh, I'd like to check out Famous Laundromats of the World by Audrey Schnorbart. Sir, excuse me, but isn't that ball and chain you're wearing just like the ones they use in the Kellogg's Special K commercial? Uh, this ball and chain? Shh. Yes, that one. How are you going to get rid of it? Well, you know, lots of good exercises. And by eating smart at every meal, starting with the Special K breakfast. Don't you have to watch your calories? Yes, and the Special K breakfast is less than 240 calories. Less than 240 calories? Right. A one-ounce bowl of high-protein Special K, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, and coffee. It's really tasty, and it's going to help me get rid of this ball and chain. I'd say it's <laughs> long overdue, get it? Your happy ending could begin with the Special K breakfast from Kellogg's. Who knows how to help you solve your shopping problems? Your Better Business Bureau knows. Listen, Lou, this fellow is at the door about the home repair, you know, and he wants me to sign the contract now. What'll I do? You don't have to sign that contract now, madam. You're not Lou. Who are you? I'm the man from the Better Business Bureau with some advice to help you to protect yourself. Read all the documents before you sign and take your time. He'll come back tomorrow. And incidentally, keep a copy of any form you do sign. And be sure you understand what you're signing. Oh, thank you for telling me. No need to thank me, madam. That's what Better Business Bureaus are for. To help protect consumers like you. Eliminate the motive, and you prevent the crime. Excellent advice, and Rexford Patterson has taken it. He has just proposed to Madeline Betty Powers because it's the only way he can think of to keep her from killing him. And now, she looks at him and says, Yes, Professor Patterson. Yes. You can't agree to marry a man and call him Professor Patterson. Oh, Rex. I know... I know it's sudden, Madeline Betty. We can get married after you graduate. Oh, I'll marry you any time you say, Prof uh, Rex. <laughs> I love you. I love you, too. I fell in love with you. I must have been at first sight. Why? Why? Because you're handsome. I was hoping I had uh, other qualities. Oh, you do. You do. But being handsome is part of it. Um... Why did you fall in love with me? Because you're beautiful. Oh. No, you, you don't believe it. No, I... Uh, well, I feel beautiful. You make me feel beautiful. Oh, Rex. I can't believe this is happening to me. It's happening. It's happening to both of us. And I'll be such a good wife for you. <gasps> what... What is it? Oh, Head. What? What's the matter? Suddenly feels so light, so 
Clear. Well, that's good. And different. Different? Yes, different. How? The book. You know the, the novel that I'm writing for the course? Yes. All of a sudden, I don't want to write it anymore. Why not? I, I don't know how it came into my head in the first place. Just as suddenly as it came, it's gone out. Gone out? That girl, Charity. Oh, yes, Charity, the heroine of your book. Is that that's her name? I, I, yes, I seem to remember. Well, she's gone from my mind, too. I, I simply can't understand how it happened. Well, why bother? Yes, that's right. <laughs> oh, why bother about anything except us? Except you and me. So you proposed to a professor and you were accepted. She seemed happy. Apparently you were reconciled. What was the problem? The problem was, Mr. Evans, I didn't really love her. Just as Eli didn't really love charity. But within the uh, theory you'd set up... Don't call it a theory. It's a fact. Oh, whatever. But uh, this is what you had to do. You had to marry the girl. And I tried hard. But she made it impossible. She will... She was... What did she do? Nothing, really. She was just so grateful to me. You pay attention to a wallflower, and what you create for yourself is a is a clinging vine. A vine that can strangle and suffocate you. And besides... Yes? Besides, there was Susan Miller. Come in, Madeline Betty. I'm not Madeline Betty, but I came in anyhow. Well, how do you do? Professor Patterson? Yes? I'm Susan Miller, uh, of the English department. You're new here. Oh, I received my teaching appointment last week. Early American lit. A favorite field of mine. Well, that's the scoop on campus. Anything early American, C. Rex Patterson. <laughs> I, uh, I just thought we'd chat. Uh, fix you a drink? A soft one. Naturally. Diet, if you have it. I'm watching my weight. Why? I think it's most attractive the way it is. Well, if you think so, I'll keep it that way. Uh, did you know that General Burgoyne wrote a play? Yes, it was called Made of the Oaks. And it was produced in New York during the Revolution. Yes, and I'll tell you who was in the cast. <laughs> That's how it all started, Mr. Evans. Easy, relaxed, delightful. There is such a thing as love at first sight. And it was there for both of us. But Madeline Betty. Madeline Betty. Well, I knew I had to do something about her. Yeah, exactly. So you killed her. No. No, that's not the reason. You wanted to marry Susan Miller. It never reached that point. I mean, we, we didn't get that far. But the prosecution will know about Susan Miller. No. They don't have to. No one really knew. No one. No one. Except Susan, myself, and Madeline Betty. I'll get it. Hello? Hello. Is Rex, um, Professor Patterson there? Oh, who's calling? This is Susan. Miss Susan Miller. Rex is for you, a Miss Susan Miller. Oh, oh, thank you, Madeline. Uh, yes, Susan? Rex, how about a drive in the country? I, um, I have considerable work to do. But I thought you had nothing to do all weekend. Uh, so did I, but, uh, I have this research project. I see. Did your project answer the phone? No. No, it's nothing like that. Well, maybe we can get together tomorrow. Sure thing. Goodbye. And who is Susan Miller? She teaches here. I'll bet. What does she teach? English. You could look it up in the catalog. I'm sorry. I'm so jealous. Forgive me. You're forgiven. I just... I just can't believe my good luck, that's all. Rex, you said you'd marry me any time I chose. Well, yes. Well, I choose now. Now? Well, 
next month. I want mother and dad and my sisters, and I have some cousins. I'd like to see the looks on their faces. The first Sunday next month. That's almost four weeks from now. Is that all right? Well, uh... You haven't changed your mind, have you? But I had changed my mind, Doctor. I see. I wish I knew what doctors meant when they say, I see. Patterson, you are the one who set up the ground rules. You said she was Charity Youngblood, reincarnated to have her revenge. I know, I, I know. Do you think that? I suggested marriage. It was your only chance. I, I realize that, but you see, I, I really don't believe that anymore. You don't? I should have listened to you when you, when you called it an hallucination. You agree with that now? I think I do. What caused this radical change? I'm in love. With whom? A woman. A woman? Yes, a woman. Not a girl, not an immature, neurotic girl, but a woman. A woman who is beautiful, intelligent, who has everything in common with me. Who has something to offer me. Just as I have something to offer her. And... What of Madeline Betty and or uh, Charity Youngblood? Charity Youngblood was an adolescent delusion. You're hardly an adolescent. In many respects, I was. I fell in love with the idea of Charity Youngblood, this voluptuous creature, but... Yes. You grow up when you meet a real woman. As I said before, you're hardly a boy. It takes some of us longer than others. And Madeline Betty? What of her? She'll have to grow up, too. Somehow, all this, it doesn't seem fair to her. Life itself is unfair, Doctor. You make everything seem very neat. Somehow, I don't think you'll be able to unwrap the package as easily as you think. <laughs> I told you, Madeline, Betty, I told you. But you said you loved me. I, I thought I did. No. But please, <laughs> Madeline, Betty, don't make this difficult for both of us. Oh, Rex, please, marry me. No, it, it wouldn't be right. I told everyone, my parents, my sister, my friends. Oh, Rex, what, what, what can I tell them now? Would you want us to live a lie? I don't care. Rex, why did you do this to me? These things happen. You loved because I was here. You went somewhere else. You saw someone else. Now you love someone else. What do you say? I don't know what I'm saying. Look, you'll find someone else, too. Uh, I'm sorry, Rex. I, uh, I've been speaking to you like a fool. You want to break our engagement? Only because it would be best for both of us. For whatever reason, I won't stand in your way. Excuse me. Hello? Rex? Uh, could you... Uh... She doesn't have to call back. I'm leaving. But before I go, Rex, I'd like to have a memento of us. I'll leave you what I wrote about Charity Youngblood and... Um, uh, could I have... Anything, Madeline Betty. That... Anything. Pistol, that old broken antique pistol? Well, certainly, of course. Well, goodbye, Eli. What did you say? Nothing. What did you call me? I called you by your name. Goodbye. That night, Mr. Evans, she left the college. Her roommate called me and said... Madeline Betty had disappeared. Well, didn't you feel that perhaps you should investigate? No. I... Well, to tell you the truth, I felt relieved. I thought she was embarrassed and had decided to go somewhere, and I... Well, I forgot all about her. You forgot? How could you forget? Maybe I wanted to forget. Anyway, about a week later, I came home. It was late at night. Good evening. What... What are you doing here? I have a key, remember? 
Look, I, uh... What, what can I do for you? Nothing. Ask me what I can do for you. Well, what? I can kill you. What do you say? Yes. I can kill you very easily. And I'm going to. Madeline Betty, uh... Who are you talking to? My name is Charity. Charity? Yes, Eli. Charity. Remember Charity? No, you're Madeline it's Betty. It's taken me such a long time to find you, Eli. Such a long time. Listen to me. I'm not Eli. I'm Rex Patterson. And you're not Charity. You're Madeline Betty Sweet Powers. talk, Eli. You always could do it. But it doesn't go with me anymore. Look, Madeline Betty, I have to ask you to leave. Oh, I will. After I kill you. No, you can't kill me. I can. With this. What are you talking about? With that rusty old antique pistol? No, not anymore. I brought it home to Father, to Isaiah Youngblood's gun shop, and I said, Father, fix this pistol. And he did, you see? How he cleaned it and oiled it. See how it shines now. Madeline, Don't Betty. move any closer. Not one step closer. See how it sparkles? He gave it a new frammer and a fresh flint, fitted a new flash pan, and then primed it. Poured in the powder, rammed home the ball, and now it's ready to fire. Charity, no, no. Get away from me. Take your hands no, off. No, me. Get away Drop from me. Drop it. Let go of me, Eli. Charity, Eli. drop it. We struggled for the gun, and at the last second, the barrel must have turned toward her, and she pulled the trigger. And that's your defense. That's my defense. You want me to plead that defense? I want you to tell the jury exactly what happened, why it happened, and the way it happened. Show them the written proof. You're sure that's what you want me to do? Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure because it's the truth. Well, I hope the jury buys it. Would you have bought Professor Patterson's story? You would. A pity you weren't on the jury. Because 12 good men and true, actually six of them were women, deliberated for a full week and decided that Rex would have to pay the price. Not just the price for Madeline Betty, but also, as it turned out, the price for charity. I'll be back shortly. This is Ray Scott for the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports. Sometimes we're accused of exaggerating the importance of a game, along with millions of Americans across the country. Well, maybe so. But one thing is sure. We certainly under-exaggerate the importance of physical fitness and sports among our children. We send our kids to the best schools we can to get the best education they can, and yet we often completely neglect their physical education. Phys ed departments are usually the first to suffer when budgets are cut. That's why we urge you to support the physical education departments in your schools and to make sure your kids are getting the kind of programs and instruction that will do them the most good. Physical fitness can help them develop into healthier adults and help them live up to their full potential. For more information, write the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports, Washington, D.C., 20201. a desire for revenge span the centuries? Not a comforting thought, exactly. It's all most of us can do to hew to the straight and narrow during one lifetime. If we're going to have to pay for the sins of other incarnations and existences, well, who has the price? But there is no price for our next meeting, when we shall enjoy another suspenseful experience. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Marion Seldes, E.V. Juster, Ira Lewis, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. The yes, answer's still the same. No dog, no baby. Just be happy with these dumb plants. They're bad enough. Taking up the whole bloody windows. I hate you. You're like I'll let you keep him. I hate you. I wish you were dead. What did you say? I said I hate you. 
I wish you were dead. Did you really say... Hey. Hey, what? Hey, what? What's this? The bloody plants around my neck. Oh. Hey, hey, Barbara, they're all around me. Mm. They're choking me. I can't get them off. Hey, Barbara. Barbara, they're too strong. Bart, 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 Barbara, don't stand there. Get them off. No. Get the scissors. Barbara, the scissors. I hate you. I hate you. Barbara. I want you dead. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>